Have you been in an FL studio and seen something called the Edison audio editor? You might have opened it up and looked at all the different buttons and thought, wow, that's a lot to take in. Well, today you will learn the ins and outs of the Edison audio editor. Please smash that like button and let's get started. So here we have open an instance of the Edison audio editor. And we are just going to go from the top left across. First thing we're going to see is slave playback to host. And what this is going to do is this is going to make it that every time we play an FL Studio, it's going to also play in the Edison audio editor. So if I have it off and I play an FL Studio, we've got that. If I have it on, it's going to play with the stuff in here as well. And this is good if you have drum loops or something like that, that you are editing that actually matches with the rest of the song. And you want to hear what it sounds like with your edits all together, instead of having to export it from the editor back into FL Studio. To the right, we have a loop option. If I turn loop on, then whatever my selection is will continue to loop. Or if I have no selection, the entire thing will loop. <laughs> Next, we have a scrub option. So if we click this, we can drag right and left and listen to our selections, which is good for quick previews. We also have our play and stop, which is self, pretty self-explanatory. Now, if we look over to the right here, we have a record button. If we click this record button, we are now armed to record inside of Edison. And so what will happen is anything that plays through the mixer track that Edison is on or through Edison will be recorded. I have Edison on my insert one here. So anything playing through the master, including my voice, will not be recorded. So if I click record, I'm talking, playing noise, nothing's happening. However, if I move this to mixer track one, and I go back to Edison, I just want you to see when I play, let's unhook that. I just, want to, I just want you to see when I play the audio right there at insert one. We've got audio coming through. You can even see it in Edison right here. So now what's gonna happen when I click record is it's going to record this audio. And you'll see that we got a recording after the fact. If I click before, I'll do this again. And it's still going to come in at the end here. And this has to do with the recording options. Append right below this recording option is going to let us add audio to Edison instead of record over audio in Edison. So I unclicked the append button. If I click record, and play again. We now have an entirely different sample in here than we originally did. I will undo that. Now to the right here, we choose what we're recording and how we're recording it. So we're going to start at this now option. What this is going to do is this is going to make it so every time we click record, it's going to immediately start recording. On input, records on input. Okay, next we have input only. And what this is gonna do is if I click record and then I click play, you notice after the input stopped, it stopped recording rather than continuing on forever like it would with on input. Next we have is on play. And so what happens when we click on play is we'll go record and play. Is I want you to notice that we get these song markers. 
Okay, these song markers are going to indicate us starting back at the beginning of the playlist or jumping back to the beginning of the song, aka a song jump. Something else you notice is that they record a lot tighter, which is great. If you're recording and you don't want to have to be clipping all this extra space, it's nice to have it record quickly. Next we have is how long it will record for. So we've got one minute, 60 minutes, or we've got size constraints. And this is great for if you're going to set up Edison to record a room or record some kind of ambience. Uh, that way you can start the recording, walk away, come back to it, and you'll have a clip at the length that you desire. So next thing I want you to take a look at is we're going to skip from this top stuff here down to the bottom. Because these couple things here at the bottom are going to correlate with a lot of these options up top. Right here, we have our waveform. We are in the waveform editor. If we click over, we're going to have some envelope controls. These envelopes will control things like panning as well as other stuff. So I am going to place a couple points for some panning. Okay, we can also control amplitude. as well as stereo separation. And then we have something else back here, which is called our all-purpose envelope. And the all-purpose envelope, we're going to leave alone for right now. We'll talk about that after we talk about how all of these are going to correlate to some of these options up here. I just clicked Control-E and I just made all of these export into an audio file in our editor. Next thing we have is we can go new, which will delete this and give us a new Edison audio editor instance. We can also load, load samples and choose samples from specific files on our computer. We can save samples. And this will give us a few different save options. We can do wave. We can do compressed wave, which may or may not be lossless. We can do wave pack, which I believe is lossless. However, is not integrated into a whole lot of different softwares, um, at least not as much as FLAC is. FLAC is a more supported file type. MP3, which is definitely not lossless. MP3s lose quality. And OGG Vorbis, which I believe not only loses quality, but is also a compressed file type. If I'm wrong on any of those, please correct me. Next thing we have is export regions. This would be for if we selected an area and turned it into a region. This region is called Shucks. I can now export that region for common use or for sampler use. Next, we have settings. Next thing we have is edit properties. This is going to include things like metadata for a title and comments. It's going to have the file name, which currently is Somatic Serpent Lo-Fi Collection, Piano Loop 13, right here. We can format the sample rate. The sample rate is basically how much information there's being used. So if we drop this to something really low and click resample, then we'll actually lose higher frequencies. And this is a technique that was used uh, in one of Drake's songs to create that underwater feeling that Drake has in some of his music. If you do that, though, I suggest you click resample. If you do not click resample, it's going to sound like a slowed down, deep, low... Uh, mumbo jumbo of your original sample, which could be cool. Next, we have our format. We have 16 bit and 32 bit float. Basically, what this means is 16 bit means there's only so many points that you can put information on for your audio files, and it's stuck to one measurement. That's it. 32 bit float 
means you have more of those sections to put your audio on. But not only that, you're not stuck to those specific locations. Those locations can move. So you can think of it like a measuring tape. If we had inches on a measuring tape and you can only place something on the inches, you would have so many inches till you ran out of that measuring tape. Imagine 32-bit float as a longer measuring tape with more inches. And not only can you put all these spots on every inch, you can take the measuring tape itself and move it up and down. You're always going to have your information an inch apart, but it's going to be scalable and movable to wherever it needs to be moved to. Next to that, we have stereo. We have mono merged, which is going to be both the left and the right merged into one. We have mono left only, which is going to take only the left audio and make it center and mono. And we have mono right only, which is going to do the same, the right to the center. And that's that. Next, we have tempo. Tempo is going to be important for when we cut by beats or amounts. So this sample here says it's 135. But if we want to, we can auto detect. We can do a quick estimation for short loops, detection for songs with constant tempo, or detection for songs with variable tempo, which is great for older music that was not recorded to a metronome. So if we do a quick estimation, it gives us 67. If you double 67, that's going to give us 134, which is pretty close to this 135. Now, because that's not quite it, I'm just going to type in the 135. And if you'll notice, as I change that, our length of beats here changed because our beats here is going to be an equivalent to our tempo and how long this sample is. You can only fit so many beats at a certain tempo within a certain amount of time. And this does that math for you. Next thing we can do is round. So if I round this one, you can see it changed the tempo. If I round this one, you can see it changed that because these things matter to each other. And then we can also go limit here. So if I choose this to be 135, but I want to limit it to 50 through 100, you're going to see we get 67.5, which is half of it. Let's say I want this to be 150 to 300. You're going to see 270. And 270 doo -doo -doo -doo, is double 135. And so this is just a quick way to cycle through and change what our tempo is right here. Now, this tempo sync, what this is going to do is this is going to take sample information here in Edison, and it is going to stretch it to fit to this master, okay, our FL Studio tempo. So even if this is 67, we're still going to have lines matching 67 in here. And we can slice on beat with 67 BPM. However, this tempo is going to stretch us and sync us to FL Studio. However, to do this, we have to go to Options, our General Settings, and we have to have checked this Read Sample Tempo Information button, or else these two will not communicate in that way. Right here in the Sampler section, we have our middle note, which is C5. So let's say you have a sample in here that's playing on a G. You can choose the G5, and it'll make that your root note. Our low and high is just limits. If I was to move this to C4, I wouldn't be able to play anything below C4 for this sample. And the high does the same thing. Our fine tune here is, I think, one one hundredths of a semitone, and that's going to be sense. And this auto detect option here is going to fine tune us and detect what it needs to do to do pitch correction. Uh, this should only be used for things that are monophonic, though, like a vocal. Next, we have undo for the last thing we did. We have undo history, okay? And then we have undo according to our envelope and undo according to spectral. And I'll show you what these do. Remember that all-purpose envelope I told you about? Well, here it is. So when we move this, our up top here is going to be anything that was prior to what we're gonna undo. And down bottom is anything after what we undo. So if I put this at a curve like that, and we go over here and we click undo mix envelope, and we go prior, prior to when we did all of our panning and other automation, 
what's going to happen is all that panning and other automation, delete this, is going to be undone right here at the beginning. And then it's going to fade into it as time goes. So remember we pan panned left to right. So I undid it, it's center. It wants to move left a little bit, gets centered to about here and then pans to the right. And then any of our amplitude and stereo separation is not done here, but you can hear it start happening at the end. And so I'll play that again. And so this is a really cool way to shape audio and do creative sound design. So what we're about to do now is pretty cool. So if we do undo mix spectral, we'll be able to actually choose by the frequency range or the frequency area, what we're gonna undo and what we're not. Top, like the envelope, is gonna be what's before the undo and bottom is going to be what is after the undo. I will do this and then I'll explain afterwards because this will stop my microphone from working, so. You should still hear some panning going on, but what we did was everything that was below the frequency range we chose that we moved our envelope up top for is now centered and back to normal of what it used to be before we did the panning automation. Anything above that frequency range where we put the points closer to the bottom is still circling our head and doing the panning, which is a really powerful tool and a really pow powerful way to do more sound design. And if you go back and look at that analyzer, top is the beginning and end is the end of our time because spectral analyzers don't just do frequency, but they do time. And then if you notice on the left, on the bottom, you will have a 10 and to the right should be about 15. And that's going to be our frequency range. And I believe it's from zero to 20. I'm not entirely sure. After that, we've got Disable Undo for large samples, which is made to help save space with working with large samples. Next, we have Cut, which is self-explanatory. If I cut, I can paste it back, right? Just C for copy, or I can go up here and just click copy again, Control C, Control X. After I've copied, I can paste. Next, we're gonna have Paste Insert, okay? Which is just Control V which is gonna just put it there somewhere. Next, we have paste replace. So if I selected this and I went here and I paste replace, it's gonna replace what was there with what I just chose. Next option is paste mix. This is gonna do half of what was originally there and half of the new audio. As you could hear, there was two things playing at once because this audio was playing with the one then I pasted over it. Next, we have Paste Mix Envelope. And this is going to, again, have to do with our all-purpose envelope. So I'm just going to do this real quick. Come here, Paste Mix Envelope. As you can hear, we had a weird quick fade that followed this envelope here. Paste Mix Spectral is going to do the same thing as Undo Mix Spectral, but with pasting. So I can tell it to leave just the low frequencies of the sample I'm pasting and leave just the high frequencies of the one that I'm keeping. Next, we have Paste Stretch. This is going to let us change pitch and stretch time for whatever we are going to paste over this. If I turn this Insert button off here, Instead of pasting over it, it's actually going to mix them just like those other two options allowed us to mix them together. I'll go more over the rest of this later. Next, we have Paste Replace Drum. This is for if you were cutting drums and pasting them in. Uh, this would help you to maintain the tails of the drums and manipulate the drums to try and make it fit the way you want it or the best you can. I'll go more over this later as well when we get to the section where these are options for editing which will be in the tools section. Clear is pretty explanatory. We clear, it goes away. Delete, instead of just clearing it, 
it's going to actually remove it and trim that space out. Trim is going to choose only what we have highlighted and it's going to keep that and get rid of everything else. Insert silence is going to be pretty much the same thing as clear. Next, we have delete part after loop. So if we were to create a section here and make it a loop, we could delete part after loop and this will be all that is left. Next, we have click free or smooth editing. If I check this, I want you to notice this button down here came on because it's the same thing. And what this is gonna do is with our edits or with our slices, it's going to create very quick fade ins and fade outs so that there's no clicking or popping when we're working with our audio. Next, we have transport keystrokes to host. So if I click this, and I click the space bar, I want you to notice I'm playing in FL Studio. We have that unclicked and I click the space bar, I want you to notice it's gonna play in Edison. So if you wanna record something or if you wanna be editing and just clicking space bar and editing in here while you're hearing your project with it, you're gonna to wanna to come in here, transport keystrokes to host. And if you're editing this, you wanna link it so that Every time you click space, they play together and you can edit them together. Now, this is the big baby. We got tools. As you can see, there's a whole bunch of envelope options. If I come back to my envelopes and I start drawing and moving things, we have an option in here that's cancel all envelopes to get rid of them. Now, our other options consist of add points at selection or add points at regions. If I select an area and I come to one of these envelopes, I can add points at the selection, which is going to add to each side, as well as one in the middle. I can also add points at regions, which is going to have to do if we have markers. So if I go ahead and cancel all envelopes, we come here and I add a region. Come over here and add a marker. Shove. Now if I come to my envelope, I can go add points at regions. Now I'm going to get a point at each one of these regions or markers, as well as I'm going to get an in between in between on this and an in between on a longer distance over here. The reason we didn't get any here is because this marker here is actually the end of a region. It's not the beginning of anything. So this is not included. And this marker here is the beginning of a region, but there's no beginning at the end over here. So these two spots, we don't get anything in the center because they're not considered regions. Cancel all envelopes. We will delete these. I'm gonna draw something in here. Okay, if we go back to these options, we have flip vertically, which is going to flip this upside down. We have scale levels. This is gonna let me multiply everything up or down and it's multiplicative. So I want you to notice as it comes down, the points get closer together as it goes up, they get farther apart. Okay. We have offset, which is going to let us move everything without it multiplying just up or down. We also have center. And what center is going to do is center is going to move all the points around the center area. Okay. Next, we have tension. Tension is just going to be just like these spaces here. These little arches are tension. It's going to work the same way, but with all the points all together, we're going to tension them one way or the other. Next, we have normalized levels. This is going to be like normalizing audio. It's going to raise it as high and as low as it can go without it clipping. And then we also have decimate points. So to show you what decimate points does, I'm going to just freehand draw on here. And we see all of these little dots and spots. If I come in here and go decimate points, I can move this threshold. And as you can see, they start going away. It's going to start simplifying it and getting rid of them. As I go to the left, technically it's supposed to add more, but at a certain point, it's not doing that. And so that's what decimating points is for. Our next option is filter. Filter is basically going to start simple, is going to make this all simplified. 
and it's going to have with option. With option is basically going to try and smooth all the curves and everything out and average it out more. The less we have width, the sharper things are. Offset is going to completely offset this to one side or the other. Decimation we just went over. Except this one, when we go to the left, is actually going to add more points. And then impulse here is pretty much the way that it's going to go about doing its job. And I'm not entirely sure how impulse actually correlates to what's going on in here, but you play with it, have fun. Next, we have smooth up. Smooth up is going to do kind of the same thing as the filter. And then we're also going to be able to change slope here. And the way I think of this is slope is going to be like the Q. If I have this turn to the right, then it's going to be kind of a wider and longer attack to the right. And so these are going to push down more. So I raise that attack, it's going to start pushing down there. If I turn it to the left, what's going to happen is as I start raising that attack, it's going to be more to the left hand side. It's going to be kind of pushing upwards, if that makes sense. And vice versa with the release. Next, we have offset, just like the other one, shoots it over one way or the other, and decimate again, which we've been over. So if I simplify this, okay, I'm going to go back and I'm going to click turn all points smooth. If you'll see, we had this big mountain. This big mountain went from having sharp corners and peaks to just kind of being smoothed around like a roller coaster. And the next one we have is create sequence. So creating a sequence, we can turn each of these up or down by section. We can do decays by section. We have sustain levels, which we can change and drop on each or move wherever we want. Release. It's the same thing. We can affect the releases. And then we can add more of these if we wanted to. Next thing we have is we have a normal option as well as a ping pong option. The ping pong option, it just seems like it doubles up. So we can reset all of this. We also have a randomize option and a humanize option, which is going to try and make it seem more real. Next option we're going to have is swing, which is going to swing it one direction. We have our attack, master decay, master sustain, and our gate. We turn the gate all the way down. We're now actually going to have a solid stop on the one side. And if we turn that gate up, that's going to go away. We also have a randomize option here at the bottom. It's just like this randomizes. This will randomize everything. So we will exit out of that. And that's it for the envelope. So I'm going to cancel all envelope points. Next thing we have is the mix down amp envelopes. That's what I did when I did the panning as I hit control E as and it exported this with those panning options I did here when I dragged these around. We have our amplifier, which is going to let us turn volume up and down. We can do this via the left channel alone, the right channel alone, or the left and right together. We also have our panning left and right, as well as a stereo separation option. To the right is mono and to the left is separate. So we can push it farther apart or pull it together. Our panning has a circular or triangular option, which is gonna change the way in which the panning is done and the stereo perception is <coughs> perceived. We have reverse polarity. And what reverse polarity is gonna do is these waves go up and down. It'll take all the ones that are up top and flip them to the bottom, all the ones that are at the bottom, and flip them to the top. We also have our normalize option, which is going to normalize the audio. It's going to push it as far as it can without clipping. As you can see, we have a spike here in audio, and it is now touching the bottom. We've got lossy normalize, which I'm assuming is a less advanced algorithm that achieves the same thing as normalize. And this algorithm probably doesn't keep data as accurate or as nice. We have our fade in, fade out option, which is going to fade in <clears throat> any selection that we choose and or fade out any selection that we choose. We also have a de-click in and a de-click out, which in the same way we have a fade in, fade out. It's going to fade, but very, very quickly. Next, we have center. And so basically the idea of center is this right here across the middle is our center. 
As you can see, there's more of this averaged to the bottom than there is to the top. And so what's going to happen is we're going to move our average to become the center. And this is also con called removing DC offset, which you may see or recognize in things like our sampler here. We have remove DC offset. It's going to make it so that our waveform is balanced and the average of the waveform will be moved towards the center. Next, we have reverse, which is self-explanatory. And we have our time stretch pitch shift, which I told you I'll talk to you about. So here we have coarse pitch. That's going to be semitones, which means a whole entire note, basically. If we play a C note and move this up, it's going to move it up one note. We have our fine tune, which is sense, which is going to fix anything that is out of pitch. We've got a pitch shift multiplier. Basically, if we move this up one and we move our fine up a little bit, it's going to be multiplied as we start moving this. So if you move this to 200, it's going to double things. If we move it down to 50, it's going to cut things in half. It's our multiplier. We also have the length in which the sample is going to be, and we can change this and it'll time stretch it to that length. And then again, we have a multiplier, which is going to multiply that or divide that so that it becomes double the change or half the change, whatever have you. Method here is basically the algorithm that is used to make this happen. I don't quite know what all of these mean, but you can experiment with them. Insert, as I had said, basically just means that we're going to make this new or paste over whatever's already there. However, if we undo this, then we're going to get a mix of both. So if you're singing and you have your vocals in here and you pitch it down five, then you just created a harmony that's going to be blended into your main vocal. Next thing we have is formant preservation. This is kind of the same thing as if you've ever used a uh, auto-tune plugin or like a waves tune or an auto-tune knockoff. In which case, you'll see that formant is generally kept different than pitch. We have our factor, which we have our coarse, which is going to be one semitone. We have our fine, just like up top, as well as a multiplier, just like up top. Now, if I move these somewhere and I click copy from pitch, this will actually copy from up here for the pitch amount. And then you'll notice we have an order option up over here on the over here on the bottom left. Now I'm not entirely sure how this works, but from what I understand, if you have a higher pitch, you want to keep this order lower. If you have a lower pitch sample or sound, you want to move this order higher. We then have a preview option. Interesting. Then we'll move to the next thing. Next we have drum loop stretch. We're going to have pitch options. Okay, uh, our multiplier, stretch, same thing. We have auto slice, which I'm not entirely sure what that does. And then we have insert tails. What insert tails is going to be is if your drum isn't long enough, it's going to add a tail to your drum. So I'm going to come down here to filling, which is going to fill when our insert tails is on. And we have different ways of adding to the end of the tail of our sound. We have echo grains which from my understanding is like a granular additive kind of synthesis when it comes to the way that the algorithm works to add the tail to the end of this. We have stretch, which is just going to stretch the audio file. And that's going to be good for kind of keeping your pitch or the, tone, the tonality of the sound. And then we have pogo. And I have no idea what pogo does, to be honest. Click it, try it out sometime. Now, our options here on the bottom is going to be blur. Blur is basically going to just smooth over and just kind of smash and make everything unnoticeable. But when using it to fill, um, that setting is going to use that same smashing and un unnoticeable effect that it does to create a tail for your drum, which can be really interesting and nice. There's actually a blur editing option that we'll go over soon. Random presence is going to create random stereo presence to help create that tail for the end of the drum loop. And loop is an interesting option that is actually going to take the last half of the sample and loop it over and over and over. So if you end up having a very quick kick and that kick is from a room mic or a drum microphone and you have the reverberation of the kick in the background, 
it's going to take that kick reverberation and it's going to loop it quickly over and over, which can help fill a short period of time without somebody realizing what's going on so that you don't have gappy or choppy drums. The next thing we're going to have here is envelope, tail envelope. Smooth fade is going to be very just nice fade between the new created tail and your drum. Whereas a pinned is going to be the same thing as smooth fade for the most part, besides the fact that it's going to be very noticeable in comparison that you added a fake tail end to your drum to fill in the space. Now, after that, we have our transient detection factor. I'm assuming that this is going to detect the transient and choose where at this tail envelope is going to start so that you can keep the transient and make sure that your transient is nice and taken care of. We also have our tail slope, which I'm assuming is going to be how much or how little and for how long, as well as smoothing, which is going to, I'm going to assume, smooth out the envelope, whether that means the blending or that means the way the ending cuts. Next, we have our claw machine. And what our claw machine is going to do is our claw machine is going to go by tempo. So we need to get a tempo in here. And what it's going to do is we are going to get rid of that period of time. We're going to trash it. And then below, we have compensation stretching. And this is going to time stretch things to fill the space of what we're getting rid of. So if I preview this. Next, we have scratch. This is going to be according to our all-purpose envelope. So if I take this and drop it, for example, like it's hot, we're going to go click this and we will click play. All right? Cool record tape stop, whatever you want to call that. And we're supposed to be able to use that all-purpose envelope to do scratching in here, although I've never got it to sound good. So I'm going to undo that. Next, we're going to have swap channels. This will swap the left channel and the right channel. We have convert left channel to mono. It'll take the left channel, make it mono. Convert right channel to mono. It'll take the right channel, make it mono. And then we have convert mono signal to mono format. If you have something with stereo width and a lot going on, this will do nothing. But if you have a left and a right channel, that are playing at the same volume and the same amount at the same time, so it's actually mono. This will take those two channels and turn them into one channel, one true mono channel. Next, we have generate noise. If I click this, the selected area, as you can see, is now extremely loud noise that I'm lightweight scared to play. So we will undo that. Next, we have run scripts. We have an amp script, which will help turn the volume up or down. We have this example thing. Don't really know what it does. We have effects. We can do bit reduction, limiting, destructoid, which I'm sure is some kind of crazy distortion. And then we also have generation. We can do pulse waves, saw waves, sine waves. We can create silence. So to give an example, I created a pulse wave for us to check out. First things first, thank me later. We're going to run a script. So we are going to undo, get rid of this. Okay, and on to the next. Underneath that, we have edit last script, which will help us pull up and edit the last script that we did. You can also make your own scripts. I didn't make that, but it's there, so that's cool. Next thing we have is acquire noise threshold. So what this is going to do is whatever area is selected, it's going to acquire a threshold and create this little green here for whatever the loudest thing in that selected area is. And then we can remove those things, like gate noise, after the fact. This can also be changed by dragging up and down on our little volume meter here, our dB meter. So I can put it there, come here, and gate noise, and it'll get rid of everything that was not above that volume. We also have the option to trim the noise, which is just going to delete those spaces. And then it's going to hug this up and move it all close together. 
The next thing we have is trim side noise, which is going to take noise away from the sides of the sample. Anything below this point on either side of the sample is going to be deleted. Next, we have trim all noise and slice up. And that's going to not just gate like it did before where it created silence, but it's going to trim those spaces and create markers at every one of those points where audio was deleted. Next, we have convolution reverb. Convolution reverb is basically reverb taken from a sound. So if I was to clap, you can hear the reverb of this room. I could load that recording into a convolution reverb like this. And then it's going to take the position of my hand and the way the room reverberated the sound. It's going to create that same room and same information and make a reverb of that room for you to use and add to your sample. So right now with what's on here, if I preview, it's a beautiful room, whatever they were using. Offset's gonna offset when it starts. If I move this to the right, see it came in afterwards. If I move it earlier, right? We have add tail. Add tail is basically going to add to the end of this. So we have this kind of a response time going on here. We're going to end up getting to the end. Add tail will help continue this and create an algorithm to continue it. Use data outside selection. If I select a certain space, then this is supposed to do something, but I don't quite get it, so whatever. We have our dry and wet faders, which is easy peasy. We have all the same options that we're gonna have in Edison here, as well as these same options down here as Edison down there. Going through here, we have the blur tool that I told you about. So if we preview this right now, it's blurred. So the amount is gonna be the amount of blurring. Offset is gonna offset when it comes in. You can see it came in afterwards there. Mix is gonna be the amount of dry to wet. And then this impulse response, I'm not entirely sure how it actually relates, but as you change it, so does the blur. Next, we have equalize, which is just an equalizer. We can change this however we want, and it'd be an envelope for the EQ. So I'm cutting everything all the way up until about 300 something. And then we have a boost from 300 something to a peak of about 750 back down. It's cutting out about 1.5 and so on and so forth. You get the idea. We can change this so we can see the high end frequencies easier. This has got a spectral view. Top is our start. Bottom is our end time. So this is the time frame in which it's playing. We have a smooth option, which the smooth option is to keep weird artifacts from happening when you have hardcore EQ curves like this. Phases is going to let us change this and change phase. We have our mix option here, as well as other options in this area, much like the ones that were used for the envelopes. Next, we're going to have clean up or denoise. Clean up or denoise is going to have acquire a noise profile, which is exactly what this is. And so with this, we have a noise profile here. And we can do denoising. If I preview this, it's going to take out everything that it thinks or thought was noise. If I move the threshold, I can also change the amount. And I can output noise only. kind of tight. Might end up having to record that and keep that. We also have a declipper and 
the declipper is actually going to help get rid of clipping that is in your audio file. And this is great for trying to save a recording that can't be re-recorded. We also have a declicker. The declicker is just going to get rid of clicks and pops. Next option is going to be to normalize all regions. Everything that we would have selected in here would become normalized. We have declick in all regions or declick out all regions. And so if I selected an area here, and I went regions, add region, something. If I click de-click in or de-click out, either one, we're going to get a very quick fade at the ending or beginning. I did the end, so we got one at the end there. I can undo this. What we can also do is we can perfect all regions. This is going to de-click the in and the out of every single region that is created within Edison. We also have tune loop. This is going to play this over and over again. I'm telling you before it starts because it's not going to stop. And this will let you edit a loop to your taste. Let's check it out. So I did that, just move things around, that way you can hear it. Next, we're gonna have convert to score and dump to piano roll. This is going to try and figure out what notes and pitches are being used in the sample, and it's going to actually try and dump those notes onto a piano roll for you to recreate the sample that's there. I've found this doesn't work very well. If you have something monophonic, then this would be something you could use, but don't expect to throw in a piano with chords and think it's gonna to dump to the piano roll in a way that's going to recreate those lush chords. We also have send a playlist as an audio clip. If I click this, here in the playlist, we now have our audio clip. We also have send a selected channel. So if I go here and I go add, <clears throat> say a sampler channel, I have this channel selected here, highlighted. I'm going to go send to selected channel. And now it is in that channel. So next thing we have is regions. Here I can add a region. This is basically going to be a selection of space. And this is something with a beginning and end. What we can also add is markers. I'm going to call this slice. Okay, A slice is a beginning, but not an end. So if I select this, it's going to run all the way to the end. If I select this, it's just going to be within those spaces. Okay, Now this is selected, I can drag and drop, and it'll only drop this section that I have selected within Edison. Our slice will go to the end until, however, we add another marker or another slice. Now when I double click that, its end is counted as the beginning of the next one. Whereas with our region, that is not the beginning of anything. So the reason I call these slices is because when you're editing, you can put these in locations. And when you take this WAV file and save it and reopen it in a sampler or drag it into a sampler, these slices are going to stay where they're at. And these will actually end up being what you can play in a sampler for notes. These will automatically set up so that this will be your C on a keyboard and this will be your C sharp. Now, with all of these that we set up, we can right click. We can turn this into a region, for example, or turn it into a marker. We can clone, rename. We can quick rename, which is going to choose something and rename it to that. We can set info, which I believe is kept as metadata. We can give it purpose, basic beat, downbeat, CD. We choose downbeat. Wherever I put this is going to become the downbeat when I drag this here. So I want you to notice the beginning of this is not on time, but that downbeat was placed on time. It was placed on the downbeat when we dragged it into the playlist. Okay. We can choose the trigger note. I told you when we load this into a sampler, we can make it so that we can play it. That's going to save that information. So this is now C5, which I clicked to play it. 
If we look here, another thing that we have is loops. So if I select an area, I can set loop. Right, if I click this loop button. And this is good for synthesis. So if I put these really close together, we can zoom in and it's going to create its own little waveform. And this is great for creating your own synths and your own wavetables. Next, we can set the first downbeat, which is gonna give us this marker, which is just like the one we just created. We can delete, which is gonna delete the ones that are there or just one in a selected region. We can rename all. first, second, and it'll play them for us as we rename them. We can quick rename all, which makes us choose what we want to name it as out of this list. We can auto rename all, which will make it give names to them according to what it thinks they are, or what it wants to call them. Assign trigger notes to all, which makes us choose out of this list. Assign to all, so we can assign these to the whole keyboard. Keyboard, we now have C5 and C sharp 5. Which I can now play on my keyboard, as well as other options here. NPC pads will assign these really low, which my pads don't work to. We have auto slicing options. We can do dull auto slicing which as you can see, doesn't really give us a whole lot. But when we go to medium auto slicing, all of a sudden we have a lot. And this is because dull auto slicing is more gonna pick up on heavy transients. And here, this is piano. We have some transient information somewhat, but it's nothing crazy. Sharp, and all of a sudden we have a ridiculous amount of cuts. We can also go auto slicing and go large grid, small grid, or medium grid. And this is going to cut by beats, which is why BPM is important. So this says 135 BPM, but for some reason that didn't work, so I auto-detected. I'm gonna go back here to large grid slicing and see if that fixes anything. Medium grid slicing. Next, we have detect beats, which is again, gonna try and slice this into beats. And it's also gonna try and snap us to a grid with these green ones, which are our down beats. After that, we have one that I actually really like, which is detect pitch regions. So this is gonna try and go by pitch, which means that most of these should sound like one note. Next after this, we have zero cross check all regions. So if I have things that are clicking and popping, I can go zero cross check and you'll see a bunch of these shifted around. And that's just making sure if we zoom in on these, that they're all crossing at the center line. And the reason we want this is because above the center line is positive pressure or your speaker cone pushing out and below it is it pulling inwards. And so you don't want your speaker trying to jump from way back here to way up here. You want it to come to the center and then that be where your next chop starts. Everything's gonna start from the same reference point, which is zero, no positive and no negative pressure, just in the middle. And this is going to stop your speaker from wanting to jump or create clicks, clips, or pops. Next, we have freeze all. This is just gonna stop us from being able to edit these. Now for view, we can go spectrum. And this is going to show us the frequency content. The frequency content. Higher up is higher frequencies, lower down is lower frequencies. So what we can do here is we can go dual view and also see the waves. But what we want to do is we want to take this and hit natural scale. Natural scale is going to spread this stuff up so that we can get a better view of actually what's going on. Anything higher is going to be more HD for you to see what's really going on. Anything lower in the spectrum precision is going to be less high definition. We can look at the display by mono, stereo, multi-channel, or just the left or the right. Our natural weighting is going to just kind of change the way that 
this is perceived. Enhanced frequency is going to enhance the view. I just got rid of it and unclicked it. And as you can see, it's a little bit harder to actually distinguish. And enhanced time is going to make it easier to distinguish and see, but over the frequency of time, which is left to right rather than up or down, which is just frequency. Fancy mode is just going to make this all blurry and cool because they want to be fancy. We also have, now that I brought this down to 512 bands, draft. And draft is going to change the way that these frequencies are perceived as well. And then we're going to have the different looks you can do. We got charcoal. We got glacier. But I always keep it to my favorite furnace. In here in view, we also have regions and loops. So if I get rid of regions, those are still there. We can still play them. However, we can't see them. And that is the same for loops. We also have time format. So come to the time format here. We have it on auto, but we can choose what we want. So let's say samples. That's going to change this section over here to samples. Or I can go minutes, which is going to change that to minutes. Or I can go bar beat tick, which is going to change it to bar beat tick. We also have our scroller above option, which will put this up top. I don't like to have that there, except for when I'm working in SliceX, which uses Edison. We have background gradient. As you can see, that changes the background here. And invert grid which as you can see, makes the lines brighter and the, and the spaces darker or inverts it, darker lines, brighter spaces. We also have snap to grid, which is going to snap to the grid, snap to regions, which will snap to the regions, snap to samples, which snaps to the samples, snap to zero crossing, which is good for if you're creating your own markers to keep them on zero crossing, and snap to pitch period, which how we Auto slice pitch is going to try and snap to the period of specific pitches. Next is our select options. We can deselect. We can select what we're zoomed into. So if I zoom in, select zoomed part, we can select after current selection, which will go after or before, which will go before. And we can select next region, which it decided to jump to the first one. So I will again select next region, and now I can select previous region. We also have zoom in, out, and full, as well as zoom on to the selection or zoom on left or right of selection. Left or right goes extremely close. So if I go zoom on that, boom, we're really close. Let's not be that close. And then in this bar here, we've got our sample rate. If we right click, we should recognize the sample properties. We've got our format. This is going to be our bit depth of 32. And then we also have our stereo here. If I click that, it is now mono. We also have tempo, which is synced to the project. We can make it free or synced. We went over the syncing and what that does. We got the name, right click, same thing. And we have bar beat, minute, second, sample, uh, length of time representation here. Going through the top here quickly because every single one of these exists in one of these drop downs I showed you. We have our undo or undo history. We can right click to get the history. Uh, if you look in the top left, you'll see what it is if you left click it and what it is if you right click it. We can normalize or normalize regions. We can fade in or de-click. We can run scripts or run last script. We've got reverb for our convolution reverb, equalize, adding markers or regions. We can tune loop or set a loop. We can drag, copy a sample or selection. We got our claw machine, our noise trimming, our fade outs and declicks, time stretch, blur, denoise, auto slicing. If I right click, I've got my slicing options. Save as and send a playlist as audio clip or to the selected channel. And if you don't have a channel selected, it'll create a new one for you. Now, jumping to the bottom here, 
We have a drop down that includes all of the same options that are up here. We've got file format, edit tools, regions, etc. File format, edit tools, regions, and etc. Coming to the bottom right, we have scrolls to reach playback marker. So what this is going to do is if I zoom in and I have this on, it's going to follow it. If I have it off, it's not going to follow it. We also have an option here to switch it back to spectral mode, which was something we saw up there. We've got our noise threshold mark that we can view. Turn that off or on. We can view our regions. We can freeze everything. It gets a cool blue look. Now we can't edit anymore. We've got our click free smooth editing, which I showed you before when we clicked an option in here to do click free smooth editing. We also have snap to grid, which is going to snap these to the grid. We have slides exceeding points or regions. If I turn this off, these will move freely. If I turn it on, everything will move that's after it as well. And last but not least, we have mute input. So if I mute this, we will not hear what's coming into Edison. If I unmute it, we will hear what's coming into Edison. I've noticed that even though this comes pre-muted, you have to click it twice to mute. I've noticed that even though this says now when you load it up, it's often set up to be on input. And I've noticed that even though this says bar beat tick, oftentimes it won't be bar beat tick. It'll be second, millisecond, et cetera. And so that should be about it. That was a long video. If you hung, if you hung out with me through that, then kudos, you're amazing. We went through all the different functions that exist within Edison to edit audio. And I would try and summarize it, but there's so much to summarize that, you know, just skip through the video, find the timestamp you need, and we'll call it good. If you like this video, please like this video. If you have any comments, please comment. I always appreciate a subscribe. It's Warren with Scale Audio and Audios.